All right, so for part 16 of the Complete Beginner's Guide to Mandolin, we're gonna be talking about getting ready for the jam. Like I mentioned in the previous lesson, going to the jam is one of the best ways of getting better. And also it's one of the most fun things that we can do with the mandolin. And thankfully, because of all the genres that we usually play on the mandolin, there are some amazing jam cultures around this instrument. And that brings us to our first step in this process, which is finding a jam to be a part of. So if you don't already have a local jam to be a part of or friends to play with, there's a lot of ways of finding local jams. There's some great online resources like the Mandolin Cafe or the session.org where you can look up forums to find local jams near you. And if you can't find a regular jam nearby, there's all sorts of other options like going to bluegrass festivals or going to mandolin workshops where you have these really intense experiences for a week or a weekend where you get to jam all day long or all night long if you want to. And there's even options online if you can't find one in person. I actually host an online jam every week. It's called Mandolin mornings it's here on the YouTube channel I'll drop a link in the description below so once you find the jam the next step is figuring out what genre of music the people play at this jam and depending on what style of music that these people play it will affect a lot about how the jam works so even the difference between bluegrass and old-time music the two genres that we've looked at in this lesson series so far there can be a big difference between the jams in each one of these circles for instance, in old time music, if you're playing instrumental fiddle tunes, usually everyone plays the melody all together at the same time and the melody just keeps going on and on and on, everyone playing together. Whereas in bluegrass circles, some people play the exact same fiddle tunes that they do in old time music, but there's a totally different treatment to how they play it. They'll usually sit or stand in a circle and take turns soloing over the melody one at a time. And then obviously as you get outside bluegrass and old time things change even more. If you start playing classical or jazz or shoro or Celtic music, all those different genres have their own jam practices and their own core repertoire that you'll have to learn as well. So that's why it's really important to know the genre of the jam before you go. So let's say you find a jam, you know what style of music they play. The next step is to learn the specific rules of the jam that you're going to. And this step is a little bit harder because every jam you go to is gonna have their own unique set of unspoken rules. For instance, you might go to a jam that has more of a dedicated leader where one person is in charge of the entire jam. They might let you know if a chorus is coming up next or they might direct you to to take a solo at a certain part of the song and you really have to listen to their direction to figure out what's going on. Or what I like even better is where you're sitting in a circle and everyone takes a turn leading a tune. So I might start things off by leading us all on a rendition of Shove the Pig's Foot and then we'll go to the next person on the circle for the next song and they'll lead us in a different song and so on and so forth throughout the entire circle. And there's all sorts of rules and guidelines that people follow that might be unspoken that you just have to watch out for and you get to know over time as you keep going to a jam again and again. So now that you're out the jam and you've gotten a feel for the rules, the next step is to pay attention to the visual cues that other people give you as the song goes on. You know, some people give verbal direction as to what's going on, but some people don't. You just have to pay attention to what's going on in their eyes and their demeanor to figure out what's happening in the song. So let's say we're at a bluegrass jam, we're sitting in a circle and taking turns playing The Girl I Left Behind. And let's say the person to my right here just took a solo and it's coming up on my turn to take a solo, but I don't know the melody as well as I should, so I wanna pass on my solo to the next person. What I need to do is make visual eye contact with the person on my left so that they know to take it next instead of me. That's a really important one. You wanna be keyed into the arrangement of what's going on in the jam and make sure that you don't drop the ball. In other words, if this person to the right stopped their solo and I didn't make eye contact with the person to my left to take that solo and I just stopped playing, there would be a break in the music and it wouldn't really be adding to the sound of the jam. And this happens by accident all the time and it's totally fine, but that's why it's really important to be keyed into what's going on with the jam so you can anticipate what's coming up next and communicate with the rest of the people in the jam so that the music keeps going. All right, the next step is giving you the freedom to try stuff in the jam. And that's what's so exciting about going to the jam is that even if you don't know the song, you're free to try playing it. And that's a whole other topic, right? Feeling more confident playing over songs that you've never played before in the jam. But even if you've never done this before, it's okay to try, right? You can check out what other mandolin players are doing for the chord shapes and try to figure out the chord progression for the song. Or you can figure out what key you're in in the moment and then use the major scale for that key and rearrange the new notes to improvise a new solo when it's your turn. Which brings us to the next step, which is 
feeling okay failing whenever that doesn't work out. Obviously, we don't wanna sound bad on purpose and we don't wanna let the people around us down or to let things slip through the cracks or disrupt the jam, but a jam should be a really safe place where it's okay to try stuff and it's okay to fall flat on our faces when it doesn't work out. Honestly, I think I learned more through those failures than I do through any successes that I have too. It's almost like a rite of passage for musicians. You have to be okay with the possibility of failure and some slight risk of embarrassment in front of friends to be able to keep learning and keep getting better. And it's almost like the more mistakes that I make in front of people, the less nervous I am actually playing with others. I don't know how that works, but I guess you just have less of a cost associated with a mistake. You've made a mistake in front of people before and you know it's not the end of the world, right? So it's okay to fail, right? And that brings us to our last step, which is it's okay to ask. So if you try to figure out the chords to a song at the jam and you just can't, it's totally okay to ask your neighbor what the chords are and I'm sure they'll really graciously supply you with that if they know. And it's okay to ask all sorts of stuff, you know, like what are those unspoken rules of the jam that people operate by? Or what are the really common tunes that people play so that way you can learn them at home and feel more prepared when you come back. All sorts of stuff like that is possible just by talking with people around you. And the more communication that you have in the jam, the more you learn and the more you enjoy it and the more you get to know the people that you're jamming with. And I think that's one of the coolest things about going to the jam too is that you really make these personal connections with people and you start building relationships beyond music, which I think is beautiful. So there you go. That's my little pep talk to you guys about going to the jam. I hope it was helpful. And like I said earlier, I think the sooner that you go to the jam, the better. You're never fully gonna feel ready to go to the jam. And the only way that you're gonna feel more ready is by actually going to the jam and getting to know what it feels like. And well, we're getting really close to the end of this lesson series. We actually just have one more video left. And I'm just so excited for you to have gone through all those previous lessons, to have learned all those tunes, all those chords, the scales and the exercises and whatnot. It's really gonna pay off in the long run. But the question is, now that you're going from a beginner player to a more intermediate level player, What's next? And that's what we're gonna be talking about in this last lesson in the Complete Beginner's Guide to Mandolin. Part 17 is all about what's next. You know, other learning resources that we can use to keep getting better and to keep growing on the mandolin. So I hope you'll stick around for this last lesson here. Thanks again for checking out these videos, for liking and subscribing here on YouTube, and for checking out the Patreon page as well. I'll see you in the last one coming up next.